One of the most uh, endearing characters in Shakespeare's plays is a gentleman by the name of Falstaff. He's something of a comic figure in the King Henry plays, King Henry IV. Uh, he's something of, of a thief, a drunkard, uh, not a very reputable individual, but King Henry, before he became king, as a prince, as Prince Hal, he kind of palled around with Falstaff, and they got into all kinds of trouble. Well, Falstaff was a rather rotund individual, uh, rather big, one might say, and in one of these escapades that they were on, he and some of his, or excuse me, some of his friends, including Prince Hal, decided that they would play a trick on Falstaff. They hid his horse when he had to travel a certain distance, and for him, even going a handful of steps would have him winded and out of breath. So he was just furious with them, and one of the friends that uh, he was upset with was a fellow named Poins, P-O-I-N-S. And of this one, he's had many problems with in the past, but over 20-some years, he continues to be his friend, who doesn't understand why that's the case, he says uh, to himself, I have forsworn his company hourly at any time this two and twenty years, and yet I am bewitched with the rogue's company. If the rascal had not given me medicines to make me love him, I'll be hanged. It could not be else. I have drunk medicines. <coughs> he thought that to explain his affection and endearing love for points, his friend, that he must be bewitched under the influence, uh, having taken some love potions, and so preoccupied. Any ordinary individual would have thrown off this friendship a long, long time ago. The false staff, in some ways reflect sometimes the experience that we have from time to time. We wonder why we do certain things. Why are we involved in this particular activity? Why are we engaged in different kinds of endeavors? And we wonder why we committed ourselves to this particular car for so long when it's constantly in the shop. I'm bewitched. I've taken some sort of a love potion. I don't understand what's going on. We might even wonder today if we are not certainly bewitched when we look at our weather reports and what we have seen this past weekend. How can it be that the day before Halloween we have uh, four or five, maybe 10, 11 inches of snow depending on where you are at here in the northeastern United States? Amazing. What explains this? When the Apostle Paul looked at the churches in Galatia, he made use of the same expression. You must be bewitched. How else to explain the kinds of things that these people have done in terms of their faith in Jesus Christ? How is it that they can, uh, on the one hand, come to faith in Christ and receive the benefits of that faith by walking in the power of the Spirit, and yet at some point having somebody come along and tell them, well, your faith in Christ is insufficient, and the beginning experiences, as marvelous as they've been of the Holy Spirit, are really not enough to carry along the rest of the journey. You need to supplant that, or you need to uh, add to that your own good works, your observance of the law of Moses, the Torah. You need to be very careful to observe all the rituals and, and all the law requirements of long ago. And apart from that, you cannot be saved. Paul looks at this and he wonders at these folks, what, are you bewitched? Do you not understand what you're doing? J.B. Phillips, in his translation of the uh, first verse or so, and also the third verse, where in our New International Version it says, Oh foolish Galatians, uh, J.B. Phillips says something to the effect that, Oh you idiots! <laughs> uh, you know, it's like writing a letter to somebody and saying, Dear idiot, <laughs> how could you be so stupid? Um, obviously, Paul is quite upset with what he has learned about these churches and the foolish bargain they are making. 
How can you depart from Christ crucified, the one who has fully accomplished all that we need for salvation, how can you depart from that gospel message and adopt a message, message that says, you now have to step in and do that which you've not been able to do up until this point by working to obey the law. You have to re-earn your salvation. Christ was not enough. Paul says that's a bad bargain and you're foolish and not just ignorant or making a mistake in judgment. This is foolish, almost to the point of being bewitched under the spell. In the Greek, the word is uh, to have the evil eye on you. You know, something like this. <laughs> Having somebody giving you a curse that deceives and blinds you to what's obviously true. Now, Paul, I don't think, is suggesting that Christians are subject to evil spells and can be uh, deceived in such a way. But I do think that the word here does remind us that there's more at work in uh, our understanding of the gospel and our understanding of God and His ways than simply an intellectual academic event. There are spiritual forces at work. And Satan is active in deceiving and deluding many different people, leading them astray. That is his work. You remember Jesus in a conversation with uh, the the Pharisees and other the Jews, leading Jews of his day in Jerusalem. They get into a dispute about who is properly the child of Abraham. And Jesus says, you are not the children of Abraham because you would be trying to kill me. That Abraham didn't do. But he went on to say that you are the children of the devil. He is a liar from the very beginning. And this is why you can't understand what I'm saying to you, because you're deceived. You're, by, you're deceived by the devil. You're blinded by him. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. This is Satan's work. He deceives and deludes people. He, as it were, casts a spell over folks. So that that which is clear and obvious and should be readily accepted is doubted, questioned, abandoned for the sake of something which is cheap. Foolish, false. It's a bad bargain. It's a stupid bargain. Yet people make it. Are they bewitched? You know, just in time for Halloween, uh, Paul reminds us of the work of false teachers in the midst of the churches. He had to deal with us in the church at Corinth, in the 11th chapter of his second book. You find there, Paul defends his apostolic ministry as he's had to do here in Galatians. And he speaks of uh, how many have been deceived by Satan's work. <coughs> Satan is one who masquerades as an angel of light. There, it's like Halloween. He's going out from door to door, tricking or treating, you know, coming with his mask. He's actually a horrible demon, but he appears as an angel of light. Then Paul goes on to say that all of these false apostles that have come to you, these so-called super apostles, who are leading you back into bondage, the bondage of works righteousness, they, like Satan, are masquerading as servants of Christ, as apostles. It's Halloween in the church. People are putting on their masks and coming in and presenting themselves as Christians, as preachers, as teachers of God's Word, but they're not. They're false. So there's ever a need within the church to unmask these fiends and to show them for what they are. To show them, show everyone the evil that they uh, would cast over the people of God. And that's precisely what Paul, Paul does here. But he wonders at the, this church. He says to them, this one thing I want to know from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Uh, he wants them to think about their own personal experience. How is it that you began in the Christian faith? What is it that brought you to faith in Christ? Was it works of the law? Obedience to Torah? Or was it simply hearing the word and accepting it? When you look at the way Paul 
presents this in the Greek text itself, it's an amazing use of language. He begins, was it by the works of the law that you received the Holy Spirit, or by the hearing of faith? Paul, by the, his very sentence structure, is pointing out to us the, the great opposition between these two very opposite poles, the works of the law and hearing of faith. They do not consist with one another. They're contrary to each other. It's either one or the other. It's either the works of the law or hearing by faith. And the big question is for these Galatian folks is, how did you receive the Spirit? That's at the heart of the question. One way or the other. Paul knows the answer. He knows how they must respond. He was there. He went through their community. He himself was the one who preached to them and saw them believe in Jesus Christ. He saw the outpouring of the, of the Spirit upon these believers. And the evidence of that in perhaps speaking in tongues, uh, works of uh, healings and so forth being evident in this congregation, they received the Holy Spirit when? If they observed the law? After they performed certain works, after they were circumcised and observed the various rituals, the cleansings, and so forth? By no means. That had nothing to do with it. Rather, it was by hearing the word, receiving it. Not your active work in doing good things, but by this passive work of receiving that which God has done for you in Christ. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit, and in no other way. And so Paul places before the congregation their very own experience of union with Christ, their own experience of the outpouring of the Spirit in their hearts and their lives. How did this come about? And for Paul, this experience is very significant. Much of the rest of this letter to the Galatians has to do with our experience of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the subject of justification rests throughout the book, but we are justified so that the Spirit may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we might live Spirit-filled lives.